Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Trust and Atira this evening. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, Dr. Thomas Leahy, who is a senior lecturer in British and Irish politics at Cardiff University. His recent book, The Intelligence War Against the IRA, was uh, published last year and sheds a new light on key questions of British intelligence and security. If you have any questions uh, for Thomas, he's happy to facilitate a Q&A session at the end, so just pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Thomas, you're very, very welcome to Trust in Atira. Great, Liam, many thanks. And thanks very much for inviting me to speak. And also for your series of talks online as well, um, which I know has been great for people uh, to keep interacting with uh, lectures and materials during the lockdown period. I will just share my screen with slides. Um, which should pop up on your screen in a second. Um, and many thanks also for tuning in this evening. I know it's uh, late on on a Monday night, so much appreciated for coming along to listen to um, me talk about this topic and my book. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to chat for probably about somewhere in the region of 50, 55 minutes, just give you an overview, a couple of the key themes that are coming out of the book, uh, The Intelligence War Against the IRA, um, and if you're interested in learning more about it, it's out in paperback, hardback, Cambridge University Press at this moment in time. So probably the best place to begin with this is talk about different interpretations of the peace process that emerged since 1998. So before 2003, leading academics and commentators, that includes uh, authors such as Richard English, Peter Taylor, and Brendan O'Brien, believed that the provisional Irish Republican Army, the provisional IRA, ended its armed campaign due to a stalemate situation. So they suggest it was not forced into peace by British intelligence. Now, but in 2003, a former British intelligence officer, alongside others, claimed a senior IRA member was a top informer for British intelligence since the 1980s, codenamed State Knife. And whilst allegedly hunting suspected informers, State Knife apparently was setting up arrests and disrupting IRA activities. Now, as we know, the State Knife accused denies all the allegations, and there's also currently an independent police investigation, Operation Canova, into the alleged State Knife activities. Later on in 2005, Dennis Donaldson, who's a veteran Belfast Republican, admitted informing since the 1980s. Now, alongside other intelligence operations, and that includes things we'll cover later on, like SAS ambushes, it's these revelations that have influenced various authors to conclude after their research that British intelligence helped force the IRA into peace. So a couple of examples of this. So Martin Frampton and John Bew's work suggests that British intelligence, quotes, won the intelligence war, end quote, by, quote again, greatly curtailing IRA activities, end quote. So they conclude, and again, another quote from their work, it was ultimately for this reason the IRA opted for peace, end quote. Now, it's key to say, whilst Mike Frampton and John Bew's work also says that political factors were key in leading to peace, that they believed the intelligence war had, quote, a decisive impact. Now, Ed Maloney's detailed book presents a similar argument, again, looking at a multiplicity of factors leading to peace. And Thomas Hennessy's work agrees with Martin Frampton and John Bew that the intelligence war helped, quote, strategically defeat, end quote, the IRA. Now, in recent years, multiple authors referenced in my book, so a few standout examples include Jonathan Powell's work, Neil Doherty, and Richard English, suggest the intelligence war was not a decisive factor leading to peace. So they basically kind of resurrected the stalemate argument that was made by Brennan O'Brien in 2003. Nonetheless, with these recent works, the focus of, that, of those studies was not specifically on explaining why the intelligence war did or did not force the IRA into peace. And that's fair enough, because that wasn't the focus of those studies. They're important studies, but they did not provide a detailed and extensive analysis of this question and what happened during the intelligence war against the IRA and why that happened. So since 2010, I've been cross-referencing various interviews with various conflict participants alongside memoirs from all perspectives 
British and Irish archival material and a range of other sources. And that evidence altogether suggested that British intelligence did not force the IRA into peace for four primary reasons. So the first reason is the IRA's small cell structure in Belfast and Derry City, and that seemed to provide additional security after 1975. The second and third reasons are that most rural units of the IRA and the IRA leadership remain tightly knit and very difficult to infiltrate. The fourth reason is some indiscriminate British security operations, again, not all of them, but some of them, and whether intentionally or not, sustaining a sizable minority of support for Sinn Féin. So instead, evidence agrees with the English, O'Doherty and other authors' view that the people process indeed did emerge from a political, a political and armed stalemate. So this just gives you an outline of the structure of what I'm going to talk about this evening. So I'm going to begin by outlining British and IRA objectives between 1976 and 1998. Thereafter, we're going to have a look at intelligence successes and failures against different regional units of the IRA. So in urban areas, we'll have a look at Belfast and Derry, in rural areas, we'll have a look at South Armagh, Fermanagh, Tyrone, and North and Mid Armagh as well. Section four, I'm going to explain gaps in intelligence on the IRA leadership, and I'm going to finish by explaining the importance of political factors and a stalemate in leading to peace. Just a few points before we get cracking with that. So with regards to alleged agents and informers, so I gathered the details of that from uh, various books on the topic. So Pete Taylor, Ed Maloney, Brennan O'Brien, and many others about this, alongside newspapers, inquiries, memoirs, and also Lost Lives. So Lost Lives is a book which contains the details of those killed as a result of the conflict. Key thing here, I'm not suggesting accusations about individuals being informers or agents or not are true or not. The book always includes denials in those cases where that's possible and also any apologies that have been made as well. I also accept that further revelations about this might emerge, but based on the available evidence, it did not appear to me that the IRA was forced into peace. And Martin Frampton and John Buehr right, for example, to say, we know that the peace process in Northern Ireland, whether rightly or wrongly, is studied as an example of conflict resolution elsewhere in the world. So that makes it pretty crucial to evaluate which factors led to peace. So let's start on the first section, IRA and British objectives between 1975, 1976, right up to 1998. Now a key caveat again here, so my actual book discusses in more detail the intelligence campaign between 19, uh, up to 1975 and British government attempts, from what I can see from archive materials, to try and get Republicans and loyalists to support some form of independence for Northern Ireland. Now, due to time, I'm not going to talk about that today. You can ask me more about that in the Q&A if you want, or could even do another talk sometime if you're interested in that. So, but it is vital to outline British and IRA strategic objectives between 1976 and 1998, because that's going to help us evaluate the intelligence war's impact. Now, so, uh, Martin Frampton, John Bew's book, for example, and work, uh, Peter Neumann, and various others suggest that between 1976 and 1990, the British government would have negotiated with Sinn Féin if the IRA indicated it would end its campaign. Okay, so that's their argument. In contrast, the evidence, in my view, seems to support Neil O'Doherty's work on this point. Now, his work suggests that the UK state did not envisage political negotiations to try and find a political settlement involving Sinn Féin and the IRA between 1976 to 1989. The Operation Banner, the British Army's post-conflict report, says that British government policy from 1976 returned to trying to reduce IRA activity to a, quote, acceptable level where normal social, political and economic activities can take place without intimidation, end of that quote. So the UK state hoped reduced IRA activity would facilitate a political settlement between the Unionist Party and the Social Democratic Labour Party. Thereafter, the British government thought the IRA would either up or become politically irrelevant. So but Tommy McConey's insightful study uh, about the IRA does outline British policy well on these lines towards Republicans. The slight difference here is McConey suggests the UK state altered its strategy in the early 1980s, 
In contrast, the evidence to me suggests the British policy did not alter towards Republicans until at the earliest 1989. So from 1976 to 1989, the evidence to me shows the British government rejecting private talks with Republican leaders about a political settlement. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of this. So in autumn 1977, for example, British ministers, intelligence, British army, IUC commanders, they created a document called the Way Ahead for Security Policy. And in that document, it outlined the policy as, follow, as follows, quote, it said the aim is the restoration of law and order and that long-term policy which leaves no scope for ceasefires by the provisional IRA, end quote. And indeed, Roy Mason as the Northern Ireland Secretary of State told Prime Minister James Callaghan in January 1977, and again, this is a quote, we have no intention of engaging in further talks with Shilling, end quote. Operation Banner, again, the British Army's post-conflict report states, quote, the British government's main military objective in the 1980s was the, the destruction of the provisional Irish Republican Army, end quote. And a former civil servant from that period agrees, Margaret Thatcher's, quote, task was to defeat the IRA. She had rather less interest in trying to resolve the political problem, end quote. Now, whilst my book does show some civil servants wanted talks, they, they weren't too pleased with this policy from the government, but evidence in the book demonstrates that most UK government ministers were against talks until the late 1980s. And we can see this with further evidence. You had the oath of nonviolence and the broadcasting bans, for example, being introduced by Margaret Thatcher's government during the 1980s. So those measures were not designed to pressurize, pressurize the IRA into talks because no such talks were on offer in the first place. Elsewhere, various authors suggest the IRA's long war strategy from 1977 aimed to force the British government to eventually declare withdrawal. Now, in contrast, again, I think growing evidence supports Neil Doherty's view of this. So for Republican leaders, the long war sought to pressurize the British government back to the negotiating table with persistent rather than escalating IRA activity. A Sinn Féin electoral mandate from the 1980s was further envisaged as helping encourage the British government to recommence talks. Now, of course, I accept that this, that critics of that view can argue, well, if that's IRA strategy, why did Republican leaders continuously declare the IRA was going to persist until the British withdrew? Again, looking at Nilo's Doherty work, he explains using various examples when Republican leaders during the 1975 ceasefire showed a willingness to negotiate, the British government actually just saw that as a sign of weakness. He also reflects how leading Republicans, including Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, saw that the IRA could not achieve, a, a, not achieve a united island during earlier talks with the British government in 1972 and 1975. Remember when the IRA was a much larger, much, much larger, larger organization, which we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. So after 1975, in the cities, the IRA rapidly reduced its numbers. The focus was switching to persistence. Now, again, a key caveat here, that's not to argue that Republican leaders were just going to settle for partition. Instead, evidence shows that they sought to persist with IRA activity, whilst at the same time maximising political support to convince the British government and others to grant as many concessions as possible towards Irish unification. Now, Danny Morrison, who's the former Sinn Féin Director of Publicity, suggests, and this is a quote, the IRA from 1977 onwards said that they were fighting until the British government come to the negotiating table, end quote. And various other Republicans supportive of the peace process agreed with that. Now, again, some listeners might be thinking, well, Sinn Féin supporters might be bound to say that. However, what's interesting is a series of non-Republicans agree that the Republican leadership, certainly by the early 1980s, sought a negotiated political settlement. So, for example, Brennan O'Brien is a former RT reporter and also an author. In his book in 1999, he wrote this, which is a quote. He said, by 1983, the thinking of the Republican leadership was in the event of a settlement good enough to bring about an end to the IRA campaign, the Republican movement should not remain on the outside. So that meant getting into elections, maximizing their political support north and south, 
to arrive finally at the negotiating table with the strongest political mandate, end of that quote. Elsewhere, Father Alec Reed, who was involved in private dialogue with Jerry Adams from the early 1980s, as we know from, say, Peter Taylor's work, uh, Ed Maloney's work, he told a documentary series in 2001, this, this is again a quote, he said, the representatives of Sinn Féin consistently told us from the early 1980s they wanted the creation of an alternative to armed struggle and sought a democratic resolution, end quote. What's interesting with this, it does appear that these views are based on hindsight either from these authors. So the Dahi O'Connell and Roy O'Broader leadership by 1977 still sought political settlements. So Roy Mason told Prime Minister James Callaghan in February 19, 1977 that he had discovered from, and again this is a quote, a reliable source that the IRA leadership envisaged that we, under considerable pressure, will agree to negotiations. The concessions demanded are the withdrawal of British troops and some form of independent Ulster with Protestant paramilitaries, end quote. Now, the later Republican leadership rejected this idea of like an Ulster Parliament solution, partly due to suspecting unionism could use that to discriminate again. Nonetheless, Republican leaders, what this shows, this example, were evidently willing to negotiate and make concessions in 1977. Another example, later, after British officials rejected talks with Republicans in December 1983, Martin McGuinness argued the British government, this is a quote, had not learned the lessons of Irish history, which had demonstrated Britain's readiness to negotiate with republicanism, as in 1920, 1921, 1972, 1975, and 1976, end quote. Interesting here, McGuinness doesn't demand Irish unification either. So what I'm saying is multiple sources, Republican and Republican sources, suggest Republican leaders sought a political settlement from the early 1980s at least. But that's just some background to get a sense of these objectives between the IRA and the British state. But let's actually have now some evidence about who achieved their aims by the 1990s. So we'll start by looking at the Belfast and Derry City IRA units. So, as Martin Franson, John Bew, Ed Maloney, and others in their work suggest, Northern Ireland's main city was always going to be a key outlet for the IRA's campaign. The much larger brigade, battalion, and company structure that the IRA had in Belfast prior to 1975, though, had unintentionally been assisting infiltration. So, one former Republican prisoner says the trouble with that larger structure was, quote, everybody knew everything about everybody else, end quote. As Peter Taylor suggests, what that meant was one informer could inflict mass arrests and was difficult to locate because of the larger units in places like Derry and Belfast before 1975. So in response, the Belfast IRA adopted cells by the mid-1970s. So these cells aimed to allow the IRA to persist with a lower level campaign in the cities in the longer term. And each cell was to consist typically of four to eight volunteers supposedly unknown beforehand to each other to try and prevent informers facilitating mass arrests. Cells also try to get volunteers operating outside of their local area to try and confuse British intelligence. And only the cell leader was supposed to, in theory, have access to volunteers. What's interesting with this Operation Banner, British Army's post-conflict report, initially felt that the cells made the IRA, quote, attacks fewer but they were much more selective, better conducted, and, mo uh, and more effective, end quote. Yet, by the 1990s, various aforementioned authors, I've mentioned previously, believed that the Belfast IRA was heavily infiltrated and facing terminal decline. And there's some examples that are cited and used to back that uh, side of the debate. Ian Phoenix, a former Royal Ulster Constabulary Special Branch Officer, and Jerry Bradley, who's a former Belfast IRA volunteer. They've both written that they estimate British intelligence was preventing about eight out of every 10 Belfast IRA operations by the 1990s. Now we know that the standout example cited for infiltration in Belfast is the state knife case. So the person alleged to be state knife, as we said, who denies that, was supposedly a key figure within the IRA internal security unit in Belfast. 
As very aforementioned authors know, state knife would apparently interrogate and then kill suspected informers. Jerry Bradley claims that state knife and the internal security unit in Belfast was also vetting operations in the late 1980s as well, which he suspects led to the decline. Anthony McIntyre, a former Republican prisoner and author from Belfast, believes this is a quote, State Knife managed the IRA irreparably and helped pay the way for its defeat, end quote. We also know about some other lower level agents damaging the Belfast IRA as well. So Martin McGartland is a self-confessed agent who's released memoirs about this. So he initially operated as a taxi driver for Republicans between 1987 to 1991. So he avoided cell restrictions, which initially made him less suspicious when operations failed. And Ian Phoenix cross-referencing McGartland's account does say that McGartland helped prevent the IRA killing an off-duty IUC officer in 1991. Now, there were some particular factors that made the Belfast IRA somewhat susceptible to infiltration. So a former British soldier said city nationalist areas' compact nature allowed, quote, nosy neighbours, end quote, to inform more easily than in the rural areas. Peter Tiz's work writes that the cell structure the IRA adopted in Belfast was not watertight either. So if we even have a look at the McGartland case, that shows that taxi drivers sometimes were having access to various cells. Tony McKinney also says that centralisation in Belfast created difficulties. So this is a quote. He said, the greatest threat to a cell system is when some, someone from headquarters, particularly if they have responsibility for coordinating or scrutinizing activities, is working for the opposition, end quote. So basically what he's saying here is if a senior volunteer was an informer, such as alleged in the state knife case, because they're not involved in operations, they're gonna be pretty difficult to find out. And then cells therefore in that scenario become somewhat redundant in that situation because someone senior is informing. Despite all this, though, having said that, the available evidence when put together, to me, does not suggest the Belfast IRA faced terminal decline by the 1990s. And we can see this because between 1991 and 1993, for example, they recommenced bombing the city centre, and that included uh, bombs near the Europa Hotel and the Grand Opera House as two examples. A former British soldier and academic, Mark Holland, also suggests improved British Army protective gear alongside the IRA's reluctance to use heavy weapons in cities frequently by the, by the 1980s partly can explain the decline in security force deaths in places like Belfast by the 90s. Also, despite some flaws, the cell structure did actually help the Belfast IRA to persist. And that's because cells often were restricting knowledge about operations beforehand. The former British soldier recalled, and this is a quote, he said, the times when you'd be given chapter and verse were very, very few. People would be told at the last minute about an operation, end quote. And again, let's have a look at this in reality, how that worked out. So for instance, Martin McGartland says his cell leader once instructed him to drive two IRA members to kill a British soldier. McGartman says he had no chance of preventing that operation at the last minute without revealing his identity. And Danny Morrison says that the cells meant, and this is a quote, the more information the informers give, it became easier for the IRA to work out who was the common denominator. So again, as an example, as more volunteers were arrested, McGartman says he was asked to join a cell. When his cell then prepared to attack British soldiers in July 1991, he informed IUC Special Branch and Republicans involved were arrested. McGartland then was quickly discovered because suspicion already surrounded him for other failed attacks, and he only survived by jumping from a high-rise flat where he was being interrogated and fled abroad. Now, this is a one point which is quite important that yes, compared to pre-1973, Belfast IRA activity does decline by the 1990s. But the cell structure is one of the key reasons for this because the IRA switch in Belfast to focus on persistence. So academic Mark Mar Holland's work also explains how once Sinn Féin began to contest elections, the IRA in Belfast and Derry City could not afford to conduct attacks that risked regularly killing Irish nationalists, whether intentionally or not. <laughs> 
And we can see this because Jerry Bradley recalls in his book, this is a quote, that there was pressure not to injure civilians, end quote, by the 1980s because, back to a quote from Bradley, the leadership worried about electoral considerations, end quote. Nonetheless, the Belfast IRA persisted by the 1990s. So much of Belfast remained gripped by checkpoints, security patrols and surveillance. So the city remained on high alert by the IRA's August 1994 ceasefire. Sinn Féin had also become the leading nationalist party on Belfast City Council by 1993. So this is a key point because it shows intelligence operations clearly not to decrease Sinn Féin support in the city either. In fact, anger over incidents seen as indiscriminate or collusive, including the Pat Finnegan killing in 1989, seemed to sustain and decrease Republican support in Belfast. Again, true, the Belfast IRA definitely ran a much reduced campaign between 1996 and 1997. We don't know why this is, but infiltration might play a role, that's possible. But Peter Taylor and Jonathan Powell's work convincingly suggests the IRA switched to focusing primarily on attacking England between 1996 and 1997, what they call focused terrorism. So they felt that would get the British government to drop the decommissioning before talks policy, and that was the IRA's thinking at that point. So if we just turn to have a look at the Derry City IRA to conclude a little bit about the urban areas. So again, what we see here in Derry is a similar thing, that the Derry IRA campaign on face value declines in intensity after 1975. And in my book, there's various intelligence operations we know about that are discussed. So again, we'll just have a couple of examples. So again, the standout one in Derry seems to be the Raymond Gilmore case. So Raymond Gilmore was a self-confessed agent there from the late 1970s. Now Alan Barker, his former IUC special branch handler, verifies some of Gilmore's activities in his book. So Gilmore once told special branch where a heavy mean gun was being hidden, that then got seized. And thereafter, special branch pulled uh, Gilmore out of Derry. He then returned, leading to the arrest of 39 people and being charged in the Supergrass trials in the early 1980s. But the courts then later reject Gilmore's evidence. Now, reasons for the of Derry often mirror Belfast due to the city environment, pretty similar. Raymond Gilmore says, for example, mixing older and younger Republicans in sales actually in a way helped British intelligence work out who was in the IRA because they're people who do not usually associate with each other. But at the same time, Barker's account and Gilmore accepts that the cells also assisted the Derry City IRA. So they say only a cell leader, often a dedicated IRA member for many years, knew about forthcoming plans. So an example they give is in January 1981, Gilmore claims he was suddenly instructed to shoot at British soldiers. Barker says once Gilmore left, other Republicans, quote, like McGuinness, were totally non-recruitable due to their intense loathing they felt towards the security forces, end quote. Now, things such as memories of Bloody Sunday, hunger strikes, amongst other incidents, meant, meant that once you had a high level informer like Gilmore being removed from an area, there was not just willing replacements lining up to take the place of that person. Again, similar to Belfast, political factors are crucial to explaining the Derry IRA's lower intensity after 1975. So Neil O'Doherty's work on Derry City suggests the SDLP outpolling Sinn Féin in local elections was important, because with the SDLP supporting rebuilding the city centre by the 1980s into the 90s, the IRA could not afford to regularly attack the city centre again, because otherwise you risk harming potential Republican voters. The other thing about Derry, um, as written about in uh, O'Doherty's work, Ed Maloney's work, etc., there was only a small loyalist population there by the 1990s. It wasn't like the IRA had to keep up its campaign to counter loyalism there either. Okay, so we're going to turn to Area 3 now and talk about rural IRA units. Now, I think here is focusing on Belfast and Derry ignores how rural IRA units are pretty crucial to the IRA's overall campaign. The standout example of this is in South Armagh. And again, that's not to say they didn't suffer some infiltration we know about. 
So what was interesting during the Smithwick Tribunal, which uh, had a report in recent years released, and that investigated alleged Garda collusion with the South Armagh IRA in the killing of two UC superintendents in 1989. What was interesting here is a former special branch member claimed a civilian who assisted the IRA was also informing. Uh, this caused quite a lot of furore in the actual tribunal, if interested to have a look at it up, because obviously, which we might talk about later as well, usually intelligence services have this neither confirmed nor policy. That was quite unusual to name someone uh, in a tribunal. Now, find various raids on safe houses, the South Armagh IRA killed this alleged uh, informer in the late 1980s. We also know that South Armagh IRA faced multiple watchtowers with sophisticated surveillance equipment on the hilltops there from the 1980s. And there's examples of British forces making a few arrests there in 1994 and 1997. And again, despite that, we have Ian Phoenix saying in his account that South Armagh by the 1990s proved particularly resistant to infiltration. And various British and Irish security personnel say the South Armagh have become the most effective IRA unit. So between 1969, they had killed 169 British security force members and what the IRA called its uh, key targets in that area. To put that in perspective, that's a figure that's almost on par with the Belfast IRA, who remember have much greater numbers. So persistent IRA ambushes and landmine attacks on British security vehicles led to vehicle patrols ending in South Armagh in the 1970s. So instead, British forces were being helicoptered in and out of the security bases. And despite the watchtowers, persistent attacks on British forces and security bases continued. So Sir Michael Dewar, who's a former British Army colonel, he concluded in his book, this is a quote, South Armagh remained consistently dangerous into the 90s and incidents occurred on a regular basis, end quote. And he gives some examples of this. So he talks about mortar attacks on Cross Maglen barracks occurring in February, April and July 1993 and again in February 1994. Now South Armagh's formidable capabilities also saw it selected for high profile attacks elsewhere as well including allegedly in England during the 1990s, according to various authors. Now, reasons unique to South Armagh made infiltration challenging there. So we'll give you a few examples um, of this. So in a 1980 British security review, this, this is a quote, it said the local population act as the eyes and ears for the IRA, making gathering intelligence extremely difficult, end quote. A former British Army commander adds to that quote, with this quote, uh, they said the South Armagh IRA were quite a small number of people, but they were supported by a big infrastructure of willing helpers. And British officials added to this in an earlier report, quote, the border exist in the eyes of the South Armagh people, and they look to the Republic of Ireland for employment, politics, and cultural heritage, end quote. So there remained an anger in South Armagh as to why this predominantly Irish nationalist area was ever placed into the Northern Irish British state in the first place. But you also had some indiscriminate security force operations were hindering gathering intelligence as well. So in Christina Toner's memoirs, uh, who's a wife of a former SDLP councillor there, she recounts British soldiers, quote, treating everyone as terrorists, end quote. And British helicopters were disturbing local activities. So in return, the helicopters then just became targets for the IRA. Furthermore, Operation Banner report accepts the quote, watchtowers were unpopular, end quote, and facilitated the IRA portraying British forces there as quote, occupiers. So the towers we can see were unpopular and they were frequently attacked and large protests in 2001 demanded their removal. Whilst British security forces also suggest in their accounts that people in South Armagh might have been too scared to disobey the IRA, their own evidence, plus other evidence from other sources, also suggests there was a clearly a, at least a sizable minority support for the South Armagh IRA there as well. Now, former British and Irish security force members also say the South Armagh IRA were, quote, extremely professional and risk averse, end quote. So attacks there were only conducted after extensive intelligence 
showed a high chance of success for the IRA. That led to fewer arrests and therefore limited any opportunity to try and turn volunteers. This training meant that South Armagh also spotted surveillance gaps as well. So between August 1992 and December 1993, IRA snipers there killed eight security force members by finding ground that was not covered by the watchtowers. And yes, whilst there was a few arrests there before the 1997 ceasefire, these, these arrests followed attacks between 96 and 1997 in Docklands, Manchester, and also locally in South Armagh. And as already mentioned, the decision to head towards a political settlement for Republicans had already begun in August 1994. As mentioned, Jonathan Powell and Peter Taylor's work agrees with various pro-peace Republicans that the campaign between 1996 and 1997 was primarily protesting against decommissioning before talks. And once that gets resolved, the ceasefire gets resumed. So elsewhere in rural areas, in Fermanagh, IRA activity is more intermittent. So for instance, they kill eight British security force members in 1980, zero in 1983, and three between 1990 to 1994 altogether. Now, in my book, there's some cases we know about of infiltration there. Most of these just seem to represent loose associates of the IRA gathering loose talk. Of course, that doesn't mean there's other people who remain undetected. That might well be the case. But units operating in Fermanagh, despite that, again, still remain the persistent threat, even if that threat is at a lower level than in places like South Armagh. So, for example, the IRA attacked Rosley, Tempo, Newtown, Butler Barracks right up until the 1994 ceasefire. And these attacks convinced the former IUC officer there, and this is a quote, the whole talk of a ceasefire hardly seemed credible, end quote. Now, the Fermanagh IRA's more intermittent campaign seems best explained by reasons besides infiltration. So a British area review there in 1980 said this, quote, the presence of Protestants within the community gives the provisional IRA the perception it's more difficult to operate unobserved, end quote. The other problem for the Fermanagh IRA, the report noted was, quote, the Protestant community is seen to be under attack so that alters the public perception of the threat, end quote. Now, since most IUC and UDR officers there were traditionally from the Protestant community, targeting them convinced local unionists the IRA was, quote, effortly cleansing, end quote, Fermanagh. Uh, Henry Patterson talks about that in detail, particularly in the Fermanagh throne area. Now, attacks such as the Enniskill and Poppy Day bombing in November 1987, it was just going to increase that sentiment there. And it does seem that even British forces recognised that perception somewhat inhibited the IRA in Fermanagh. At the same time, Crosby Keown, who's a former Republican prisoner, also said, and this is a quote, these small rural places depended on whether people could come together who had leadership qualities. Perhaps the activities died off because a few of them were killed or imprisoned, leaving nobody there to grab the initiative, end of that quote. And in Kieran, Kieran Conway's memoirs, another former Republican member, he agrees with this. And he says, quote, rural areas are variously strong or weak, depending on one or two strong personalities, end quote. So in the case of Fermanagh, various interviewees said that Seamus McElwain from Monaghan was key. Hence, the IRA potentially could be a reason why they selected him to escape from the maze prison in 1983. Various security force members and unionists, though, claim that McElwain was responsible for at least a dozen killings around the Monaghan Fermanagh area. IRA activity certainly did decline in Fermanagh when he was arrested in 1981. Once he escaped in 1983, we can, still be, we can see that the IRA killed five security force members there in 1984, before again declining thereafter, which could suggest it coincides after McElwain was shot by the SAS in 1986. On that particular incident, various sources say the SAS shot McElwain after a soldier spotted a tripwire during a routine patrol. So it wasn't because of um, intelligence gather beforehand. In the particular incident, the SAS said the IRA tried to fire at them when they told them to stop, but Republicans disagree with that account. Again, let's have a look at another uh, smaller rural area. So in this case, North Mid Armagh units which, okay, operate some towns, but these are much smaller in nature 
than in Derry and Belfast. They have more in common with rural IRA units. So with North and Mid RMR units, quite an interesting case this because they do kill various alleged informers by the late 1980s and they had faced SAS ambushes and other uh, ambushes by the uh, IUC units which have been carrying that out in the early 1980s. But we also see the Mid and North Armagh units renewed their campaign by the 1990s. So Lurgan, Portadown and Armagh suffered significant damage after IRA bombings in 1992 and 1993. As with other sparsely populated rural areas, what made the North and Mid Armagh IRA particularly dangerous was their ability to inflict numerous deaths and single attacks. So a couple of examples from the 90s of that, three IUC officers were killed in July 1990 and two UDR officers killed in Armagh City in March 1990. So Michael Dewar in his book concludes the North and Mid Armagh IRA remained quote particularly challenging end quote for the security forces by 1994. Now again some specific factors that are unique to North and Mid Armagh units seem to explain this kind of renewal of the IRA's campaign there by the 1990s. So there were fairly persistent allegations there of collusion between elements within the security forces and Wilson. So the lost lives, the book, as we said, that details the, all those who lost their lives because of the result of the, uh, the conflict. So lost lives, for example, explains how in March 1990, Republican Sam Marshall was shot by loyalists. And again, this is a quote about the incident from lost lives. As he was walking to his home in Lurgan, after signing bail conditions with two other Republicans at Lurgan IUC barracks. Republicans claimed police collusion, saying only the men, their solicitors and the IUC knew what time they had to sign on for bail, end quote. Now, a historical inquiries team report, the IUC and the British government deny collusion took place and reject that claim. Republicans disagree with that. Now, the persistent of, persistence of IRA activity shows Marshall's killings, at Marshall's killing and the earlier shoot, alleged shoot to kill allegations it certainly didn't reduce militant Republicans. Whether the allegations are true or not, certainly the evidence doesn't seem to show that it decreased permanently the North amid our IRA's campaign. So what's interesting with this unit is it also shows IRA units could reactivate their campaigns despite facing earlier ambushes and setbacks. But it is important at this point we need to talk about the East Rhone IRA where things were a little bit different by the late 1980s. So by the mid 1980s the East Rhone IRA was initially described by British officials as quote particularly secure against infiltration end quote and they have been inflicting numerous casualties in single attacks including in July 1983 killing four UDR officers after their vehicle struck a landmine near Valagoli. And in August 1988, they killed eight British soldiers via bus bombing between Omar and Valagoli. But it's certainly the case that IRA activities declined in the East Rhone area and where they operated by the 1990s following SAS ambushes. And as Ed Maloney, Mike Frampton and others have detailed, the standout example of that came in May 1987. So eight IRA volunteers were shot by the SAS whilst they attacked Lockgall police barracks. These authors also note similar SAS ambushes killed various other East Tyrone IRA members by 1992. And various British security personnel and Republicans suggest human or electronic intelligence was setting up those ambushes. Nonetheless, Sinn Féin still was retaining a sizable minority of political support in local council elections across Tyrone from the 1980s onwards. So again, it's the point that intelligence operations didn't seem to deter Republican electoral support in the area. So let's just have a look at some reasons why rural IRA units were generally difficult to, to significantly infiltrate. Well, the small and tight-knit nature of rural IRA units made them difficult to infiltrate and apprehend. According to Tommy McCurney's work, he suggests that rural units consisted of, quote, friends or workmates, etc., end quote. Now, there's a key point here that McCurney says, which is, quote, the downside to that was if one member was exposed, the others immediately came under suspicion, end quote. And the SAS ambushes in against the East Rhone IRA could demonstrate that. 
But a key point there is ambushes were infrequent, for example, in Fermanagh and South Armagh from the 1980s until the SAS was phased out in the 1990s. And that's despite, interestingly, British archive material showing security officials in the early 1980s sought sustained SAS activity in Fermanagh and South Armagh, but that never emerged. Now, crucially, rural IRA units also appear to be semi-autonomous. So one former British soldier stated this, quote, anyone coming in from Belfast thinking they were just going to do a check on rural IRA units would just be told to think again, end quote. And interestingly, Eamon Collins, a former Newry IRA volunteer who released memoirs, he claims that the South Armagh IRA, as an example, were always vetting their own volunteers. Darach MacDonald's book about South Armagh convincingly argues there existed some, quote, tacit and active support for the IRA there, end quote, in places like South Armagh. So in 1980, British officials agreed that the IRA maintained sizable minority support in South Armagh by representing, quote, the ideals commonly accepted by the population, which may gather an intelligence extremely difficult, end quote. The opposition to the UK state in these areas was partly historical. So if we go right back to the time of partition, South Armagh, Fermanagh and Tyrone actually had nationalist majorities. Now, White's research also political and economic discriminations was particularly evident before 1969 in those counties and that was to enable the actual minority unionist population in those counties to continue controlling local councils in places like Tyrone and Fermanagh. So what this led to is obviously long-term anger against the British state. And again some British security activities in rural areas, not all of them but some of them, certainly were encouraging a sizable minority of active or tacit IRA support. So that includes things like internment about trial, which is detailed, for example, in Martin McCleary's book about internment. Now, British forces blocking and creating cross-border roads to disrupt IRA activity certainly provoked further hostility. Now, Operation Banner report by the British Army admits that closing cross-border roads was, quote, generally unpopular with the local population, many of whom had legitimate farming, business and family links across the border, end quote. So we know that local Republicans, for example, frequently removed the roadblocks. Various British and intelligence personnel agree with this quote from Danny Morrison, which is that, quote, rural units were extremely important for the IRA. Why is this? So first, the rural units provided the IRA with opportunities to kill a greater number of security force members in single attacks in a wider terrain without risking mass civilian casualties, which could have harmed Sinn Féin's vote. The bombings in England also allegedly provided another outlet for difficult to infiltrate South Armagh units by the 1990s as well. And lastly, rural units stored and ferried supplies across the border. And the crucial point is so important were rural IRA units to the IRA campaign. The Operation Banner report has reflected, and this is a quote, with hindsight, the border area was critical to the conduct of the provisional IRA operations and therefore should have been the geographical focus of our campaign, end quote. Okay, so moving on to area four, which is about the IRA leadership. So various IRA attacks in England and the Libyan weapons shipments from the 1980s suggest the IRA leadership was not significantly infiltrated. So various aforementioned authors and interviewees have explained how the IRA Army Council, the seven person leading body, would have sanctioned these operations and selected the volunteers for them. Again, that's not to say there's not some failures with operations in England as we look at that first. So we know Sean O'Callaghan, a self-confessed informer for Irish and British intelligence, prevented some operations in the early 1980s. And we know also that two IRA members, as an example, were arrested in July 1993 in Scotland for, uh, following surveillance. And operating in England posed challenges for reasons further discussed in my uh, book about this. But again, nevertheless, evidence suggests the IRA maintained a persistent campaign in England from the late 80s into the 1990s. So for instance, by the 1990s, there were various high profile incidents. So in February 1991, the, IFI, the IRA fires mortars at Downing Street. In 1992, there was the Baltic Exchange bomb in London, which cost millions in damages. In April 1993, there's a tower bomb at Bishopsgate, killing one person, injuring 30, 
and costing £350 million in damages. And on the 9th, 11th and 13th of March 1994, IRA units fired mortars onto Heathrow Airport runways, although none of them exploded. And then after the ceasefire ends temporarily in 1996, we have the IRA's Docklands bomb in February 1996, inflicting £150 million in damages, and the Manchester bomb in June caused £100 million in damages. Now, Christopher Andrews' official history of MI5 notes IRA incidents in England increased in the 1990s. And as a, very, a, as a veteran troubles commentator said in an interview, this is a quote, if the IRA had been heavily infiltrated, the British security forces would have made it a priority to stop those England attacks, and they didn't manage to do that, end quote. Now, a former British soldier commented infiltration in England of IRA units was challenging because, quote, the provisional IRA kept it pretty tight because only a few individuals were involved. So what you would not have is those low level sources, eyes and ears individuals, end quote. Jerry Bradley suggests that whilst many volunteers might have been involved in England operations, quote, one individual would get something from A to B, somebody from B to C, so they wouldn't know what each other was doing, end quote. And a Republican interviewee agreed secrecy was paramount for the IRA in England, quote, there would have been absolutely no communication backwards and forwards, it's going undercover for however long is necessary, end quote. Now, mixing volunteers from across Ireland in England units made linking them together challenging. Volunteers, it seems, in England were often rotated after failed attacks as well, and that prevented informers permanently disrupting attacks. We've got a similar case with major weapons shipments. Again, some of these were intercepted. So in 1984, Sean O'Callaghan set up a shipment of arms from Boston to be seized. He claims that loose talk from someone involved help him discover the details about that. And later, as authors including Abalone and various others have detailed, a major consignment of Libyan weapons was intercepted off the French coast in 1987. But nevertheless, the IRA still landed various weapons consignments from Libya by the late 1980s. Christopher Andrews' official history of MI5 notes MI5 reflecting internally, quote, that the provisional IRA had acquired from Libya more weapons than it can actually use, end quote. And Sean O'Callaghan says the Libyan weapons were, quote, a security disaster. They provided the IRA with the wherewithal to continue their activities indefinitely, end quote. So it appears here that selecting trusted members from, for these shipments frequently worked to stop them from being intercepted. So it seems the IRA leadership was not extensively nor permanently infiltrated. So let's just talk about political factors and the peace process. So available evidence suggests a political and military stalemate primarily led to peace, as we talked about as authors before 2003, including Peter Taylor, Richard English and Brendan O'Brien originally concluded. And as Neil O'Doherty and Catherine O'Donnell's work has suggested, Sinn Féin's sizable minority of the Irish nationalist vote in Northern Ireland, which was approximately 30 to 35 percent, according to British government calculations by the 1990s, alongside the IRA's persistent campaign, influenced the British government, the Irish government and other convict participants to include Republicans in peace talks. Now, John Hume said he began talks with Sinn Féin in the late 1980s because, quote, five British governments and 20 thousand troops had failed to stop the violence, end quote. In 1998, the SDLP Sean Farron justified peace talking Republicans because, quote, Sinn Féin does represent a section of the people of Northern Ireland, and political progress would be much more likely if that section of the community was able to join with other sections of our society, end quote. And former Taoiseach Albert Reynolds writes, quote, no one believed the IRA could be stopped. The British Army could not defeat them, end quote. So consequently, the Irish government and John Hume began dialogue with Sinn Féin in the late 1980s, as you will know, is further detailed in Catherine Donald's book, uh, Peter Taylor, Ed Maloney, etc. Now, what's key here is Neil Doherty and Catherine Donald suggested these subsequent pan-nationalist talks also helped convince the British government to alter slightly its strategy towards Irish Republicans. 
Otherwise, the British government could not create a political settlement in the 1990s. So, for example, John Major, in his memoirs, claims peace talks in 1991 and 1992, which excluded Sinn Féin, failed because Hume wanted, quote, to wait until the provisionals were ready to move forward, end quote. Later, Jonathan Powell says Blair's government had, quote, no way of going ahead without Sinn Féin because the SDLP and Irish government would only countenance that option if Sinn Féin had been given a chance and had walked away, end quote. Now, British strategy returned to what was previously attempted in June, July 1972 and between May 1974 and January 1976, which was to erode the IRA's capacity whilst attempting to persuade Republican leaders to accept a political compromise. And this dialogue recommenced on and off from 1989. At the same time, existing evidence supports Richard English and other authors' views. And that's that the IRA and Sinn Féin leaders agreed to peace talks partly because of electoral politics. Sinn Féin was unable to outpoll the SDLP by the 1990s and was not making significant electoral progress in the Republic of Ireland and there's various reasons for this discussed in the book and other books as well, such as many Irish nationalists disapproving of the IRA's activities, whether intentional or not, things like killing civilians, and restrictions on Sinn Féin publicity due to broadcasting bans as well. But Tommy McCartney's book makes a key point here, and this is a quote. He says, unionism had a majority in Northern Ireland, and for as long as the 26 county state and its population insisted that unity could only come by the consent of the majority of the six counties, Britain was under no political pressure to accommodate IRA demands, end quote. So here, Sinn Féin and the IRA had helped cause political deadlock. But McCartney's point is, and the evidence seems to back this, they also faced deadlock because of the opposing SDLP, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Aussie Unionist Party, Democrat Unionist Party electoral mandates, and you had continuing loyalist and British security force campaigns as well. So Republican leaders recognised a rethink of tactics was needed if they wanted to move their campaign for Irish unification forwards. So in January 1989, Gerry Adams suggested in an interview, quote, armed struggle is but an option. There's no such thing as the primacy of armed struggle. It's a primacy of politics that's important. These and other statements that I've noted in my book suggest the option of armed tactics could be reviewed if a majority within the Republican community saw that other options would better advance their aims. But nonetheless, Republican leaders still sought to maximize their concessions. But the Downing Street Declaration of 1993 underlined what the British government would concede before a political settlement. So as Catherine O'Donnell writes, it did demonstrate one success for Irish nationalists. So the British government recognized in the Downing Street Declaration that all island self-determination would be voted on North and South separately but concurrently in the future. Yet the British government said in the meantime there would be devolution within the UK for Northern Ireland. So Bew and Frampton are right that since the Irish government and the SDLP agreed with that, Sinn Féin and the IRA alone could not alter the declaration's terms. But having said that, as Neil O'Doherty suggests in his work, Sinn Féin and the IRA recognised opportunities as well. So the Irish government and the SDLP had backed Sinn Féin's inclusion in talks. And whilst not what Sinn Féin ultimately wanted, the pan-nationalist talks had influenced the British government to accept some form of all Ireland self-determination in future referendums. Sinn Féin's northern electoral support also increased as it went towards peace from 1993. So Republican leaders felt the political benefit of the armed strategy would outweigh the benefits of continuing the armed campaign. So just a few quick thoughts in, uh, in conclusion to finish off. So overall, the urban IRA cell structure, alongside the elusive nature of many rural IRA units and the leadership, prevented the IRA from being forced into peace by British intelligence. That's what the evidence seems to me to suggest. Some indiscriminate British security activities also were sustaining IRA support and activities. So what this means is that pre-2003 explanation for the peace process by Richard English, Peter Taylor, Brennan O'Brien and others as emerging from a military and political stalemate is accurate. So my works provided the first detailed analysis and research to explain why the intelligence war did not force the IRA into peace that was previously absent in previous studies. <laughs>
And just a few final thoughts before uh, looking forward to engaging your comments and questions. So first, available evidence suggests that overemphasizing intelligence campaigns to help produce peace between 1976 and 1989 didn't work. And any indiscriminate intelligence activities, whether they were deliberate or not, simply just sustained persistent conflict. And as Neil O'Doherty and others have demonstrated, UK civil servants and politicians who proposed reopening dialogue earlier were just overlooked. The second kind of key theme is that my work agrees with Jonathan Powell's analysis that dialogue, political mandates, and a mutually hurting stalemate in particular were key in creating peace, as his book goes on to further explain. Now, I haven't spoken much due to time about political intelligence on Sinn Féin, including Dennis Donaldson case. I can do that in a question and answer session if you're interested in that. So on a day to day level, British intelligence did disrupt some IR activities in specific areas at specific times. But that's not the same thing as saying British intelligence overall pushed the IRA into permanent decline and peace. So even if, for example, the local ambush hadn't occurred and the IRA had carried out that attack, Sinn Féin still lacked the majority nationalist political mandate by the 1990s that was needed to bring about imminent Irish unification. So neither informers nor intelligence operations were pivotal to bringing about the peace process. Okay, so many thanks. And as I said, looking forward to comments and questions. And thanks for listening. Thanks so much, uh, Thomas. Really enjoy that. Uh, if you can shop, I think you have stopped uh, screen sharing there. That's great. So we can see up close to personal and the questions. I, I've... I've one particular question for myself. I always get an opportunity to answer or to ask my own question first. What got you involved uh, originally in this area of uh, Irish history? So what's your own background? Yeah, thanks, Liam. So I think the key thing with this was when I was studying this topic at university in London, and that was not too long after the revelations had started coming out about senior informers and agents. And where it kind of, for me, it was interesting looking at these different articles and, you know, I make that clear that the people I disagree with as authors, like I could see their case and how they built it. They've done a lot of key research on that and put a lot of work into it. But I think for me, just from partly learning about the course uh, and what was going on in the conflict, what I couldn't understand if the infiltration was as significant as what was starting to be said it might be, then how come attacks you know, of such a major nature were going on in London, for example, in the 90s or in Manchester? Um, and when I guess when I started to look more around at the kind of literature on the conflict, so looking at places like Toby Harden's book about South Armagh is one example, that interests me as well to think, well, hang on a minute. It's not just like the IRA's campaign in England is the last kind of part that was really um, high in intensity by the 90s because there's the South Armagh campaign the renewal of bits of the IRA's campaign in Belfast. So it was partly just from that really, and then having a look into the topic and seeing, well, has anyone written in detail with another kind of side of the debate with this? And I didn't find it. So yeah, just kind of went from there really. So it was just from the kind of emergence of the topic in the media um, that got me interested in it. But yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks, Thomas. There is one there from Kevin. Uh, thank you, very interesting. Can you speculate on how much damage Daniel Donaldson did to the Republican movement. Okay, thanks very much for uh, the question and for coming along as well. Uh, the Donaldson case is interesting. And what's interesting in the Donaldson case is various people interviewed, um, and this is also in various people's books as well, said that the key thing here with Dennis Donaldson, from what we know, that there are some accounts that says he would have had potentially some impact on the IRA as well from past information to British intelligence. But I think the key thing we're looking at here is about what political intelligence was he passing to, in a sense, leading people in town Downing Street. And I think this, this is an interesting debate because it's possible, and I can see this, in a sense, what Donald Donaldson would have been doing. Um, and I remember Brian Rowan wrote some stuff about this. Um, this uh, former senior British civil servant I spoke to this about, and then Danny Morrison. I think what, they, what was interesting cross reference in their accounts is said, Dennis Donaldson was probably, say that Sinn Féin were meeting British ministers on a Monday. Dennis Donaldson was probably telling them, this is the kind of thing they're going to bring up on Monday. You'd be telling them that on a Friday about what was going to happen on Monday. 
but what's quite and that would have some influence i think where that would have an influence is i think it was quite key to convince british government ministers that like Sinn Féin and the ira was serious about the peace process because it's pretty evident from the fact that we know from the back channel contacts from what Sinn Féin released that various authors even ones that i disagree with agree seem to be a pretty accurate account of what was going on with back channels when they were reopened by 1989 up to 93 there wasn't much contact in the early 1990s under Major's government. So something changes in like the mid 90s as talks, as I mentioned, about Sinn Féin um, didn't work. Plus, I think there that that's where Donaldson and people would come in. Because if there was anyone in the British government was unsure about what's going on, they would be saying, you know, these people are serious about peace. Alongside all the other stuff happening with the IRA's campaign, like this, this is serious. They're, they're quite serious about trying to get to peace. So that would have a role. But again, I think a key thing here, and I noted this particularly say Jonathan Powell's account and a former senior British civil servant I interviewed, what's interesting with both of them is they say, we had a feeling, we had an idea of what they might want Republican leaders in the next set of talks. But what we didn't know is exactly where they were trying to go with this. So what's interesting with the Donaldson thing there, it does suggest it's outside that inner circle. Okay, it's a high level, but outside the inner circle, because there seem to be those gaps which former British officials and ministers admitted they didn't quite know. Um, but yeah, good question, and thanks for asking. And the next one from, uh, is from Colin O'Connor. Uh, how would you describe the relationship between intelligence between the Irish government and the UK government? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. Thanks for that. What's it, this is something interesting as well, that we so some of other research at the moment is looking at the role of the Irish government in dealing with conflict legacy and there's some good research that's come out particularly about the 70s on the Irish government's involvement in conflicts like Patrick Moreau, Brian Hanley and then you've got a couple of um if you're interested in this kind of thing accounts about the Gardaí and the conflicts of Vicky Conway um is one example of that some others which I've forgotten from the top of my head uh, at this second but what's interesting there we don't know as much about Irish intelligence and what exactly was going on. And this sounds a bit odd, but I get the impression there's a little bit more layers of secrecy there than actually about counts for British intelligence, um, which is interesting in itself. You know, someone was going to look at that or do research on that question. But I think what we do seem to know, and I think it goes to that question from the late 80s, in terms of, like, again, political intelligence or sharing information, I think it's been underestimated. And Catherine O'Donnell's earlier book, which is really good about this, is about relationship between Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin. She makes this important point that often it's been overlooked that the Irish government, the SDLP, alongside Sinn Féin had a big effect on convincing the British government about the peace talks and to kind of re-establish contact with Sinn Féin in the 90s. So obviously there's a lot of back-channel conversations and background conversations going on between the Irish and British government there. Um, but what we don't know, obviously we know about the Sean O'Callaghan account, that's one of the real standout ones, where this was someone who was passing information to Irish intelligence services and then switched when they relocated to passing information to British intelligence. But we don't know the extent with Irish intelligence, and it's definitely an interesting case in future. But yeah, thanks. Good question. Another interesting question from Charlie, and uh, his question is around IRA intelligence. Uh, did it ever get to the same level as British Army intelligence, or has there been any studies done of the level of uh, IRA intelligence and what they accomplished? Yeah, thanks. That's a, again, that's a really good question. I think there is one study done by this. Um, I want to say Iladi. Last name, I might pronounce that wrong. There was one about IRA intelligence, how they gathered it. I think there's some, like, I don't know much about this, so I'll make that clear. But I think that one of the key things, if you look at some of the attacks that are happening in the conflict, like a couple seem to stand out. Like one example would be, or oh, I think it's in 1996, I might be wrong on that, on the dates, which is at the British Army's headquarters in Lisbon. And there seems to be some kind of IRA car bombing there. That would suggest, you know, and again, I don't know anything about that, but what I'm saying is that it's pretty difficult to, I'd imagine, get inside an armed fortress. So obviously there was something going on there, potentially with information inside. So, you know, there's some in 
incidents that would suggest the IRA wasn't just by luck managing to get away with these things. I think that would be quite key. But again, when you look at what's going on, um, for example, mention the attacks in England, but also what's going on in South Armour itself. And that was a very, very key thing, as I pointed out, coming out from interviews that people were, and British forces and Irish Gardaí were saying this as well, that that's what was making the South Armour IRA sophisticated. It was a level of intelligence they're putting into beforehand before actually doing an attack. And to give an example of this, I remember uh, one Republican interviewee said that they knew about someone who, after they got out of prison, went down to South Armour and then were asked by South Armour IRA just to do some intelligence uh, on watching helicopters land. So they came back and then said, I think it was between like 12.5 seconds to 13 seconds or something like that. And the South Armour IRA said back to this person, that's not good enough. Like, is it 12 seconds? Is it 12.1? Is it 12.2, 12.3? Go and have another look. So that level of precision of detail, and it's interesting, as I said, that you know, your British and Irish security forces saying that was the major difference in South Armour was the level of input and intelligence they were doing beforehand. So yeah, another, again, really good question um, and certainly a really interesting area for further research as well. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, one final question for you. We leave you after the hook after this one this evening. Uh, one from uh, a good friend of the lecture series here at Colm O'Rourke. Thanks for tonight, Thomas. Excellent lecture. I will pick up your book for sure. Can you give me some detail as to why the provisions organised cell structures? Had they suffered much to informers beforehand? And why didn't the INLA command follow suit? Okay, yeah, many thanks as well. Uh, for the question and the book as well. Um, so it's an interesting question. So essentially what happens, and as I said, my book, there's a couple of accounts, like Peter Taylor's account talks about this as well, very well, uh, alongside others. Before 1975, so the IRA used to operate in Belfast and Derry on this um, brigade battalion company structure. The difficulty, with, so this is interesting, and Republican interviewees said this, um, the, one of the advantages of that, it did help this kind of local collegiality because you would probably be an IRA company with the similar people from your street, for example. The disadvantage of that was that if you had 20 of you in a unit and one of you becomes an informer, the rest are going to get arrested. Because there's things that we know now, um, for example, from like Lost Lives or Edmund Lee's account or Gary Chish, et cetera. What sometimes the, the intelligence services would do in before 1975, when you had this larger IRA structure, what they would do is when they would, they could have arrested a whole unit at once, but what they would do is pull everyone in and then release like six of them. And one of them would be the informer. So the damage would just keep continuing to go on because when the IRA was doing that level of operations, which it used to be doing in Belfast, not so selective, much more kind of engaged with British forces regularly. The problem was with that, they didn't really have an ability to try and work out, in a sense, that quote from Danny Morrison, really, which they had late with cells, who's the common denominator here, trying to work out patterns. So the cell structure then we can see by 1975, I mean, Operation Banner Report says this by the British Army, that, you know, at one stage by like 73, 74, because you had internment as well, so it was easier, you could just pick people up and intern them in that respect you know, IRA person might join the IRA in Belfast and then get arrested in four weeks, roughly, by about 73, 74. So it's quite stark. And that's the, really, that's the difference later that the cells bring in, that the IRA realised, I think particularly then after the collapse of the 72 ceasefire as well, June, July then, this was going to be a persistent conflict. So if it's going to be a persistent conflict, you can't keep constantly having people arrested or interned or regularly apprehended you needed to have this kind of more persistent low level conflict to try and achieve your objectives overall. The key, so Derry would have had a similar thing. Uh, what's interesting with Derry is that that seemed to happen earlier, um, partly because of Operation Motorman, the, what seemed to be coming out of security uh, force and also uh, Derry IRA volunteers accounts is that a lot of Derry IRA, particularly leadership went to Donegal. And then there was a couple of people who'd be sent back across in smaller units by about 73, 74 into Derry. Um, but what's interesting there is that that seems quite effective by the 74 ceasefire to an extent because the Derry units were seen as quite uh, dangerous by the security forces. But a key point I said with that, again, that's an urban area phenomenon. Like you don't need cell structures in rural areas because they were already small units anyway. And at that point, certainly as my book talks about, it doesn't seem to be like extensive infiltration 
the time you get to the 75 ceasefire in those areas. But yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks so much, Thomas. Um, we've got buckets of other questions, but we're going to leave you off the hook for this evening. Uh, thanks for an extremely informative lecture. Um, we've really enjoyed it. Uh, you've given us a new insight to another aspect of Irish history, which is, which is what we're always about here and Trust in the Tira. Next up uh, on Wednesday, we have an exploration of Ulster Scots literature with Dr. Frank Ferguson. So um, until then, and thanks so much again, Thomas, for uh, joining us. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And, and, and as I said, giving us a, a, a new insight into, you know, an, an unspoken aspect of our Irish history. Thank you so much. Great. Many thanks, Liam. And thanks to everyone for coming along as well. And good evening to everyone as well. Thanks. It's longer for all.